everybody. Wow, it's very bright. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks to Orst and uh, to Jeremy and to Boris for flying me out here. Uh, you can tell by how many exclamation points that I've left in how excited I am. Uh, and one of the main reasons why I'm excited is because uh, doing lectures like this gives me an opportunity to be in one of my favorite types of photographs, which is uh, the graphic designer giving a lecture with huge letters behind him. Uh, so, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so, this is just a, an opportunity for me to get a possible profile picture for Facebook or an Instagram post. <laughs> Uh, but if, it, if so, if anyone would f take a photograph of me with this next slide, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> and I'll just <laughs> thank you very much. I'll just leave this. I'll just leave that up for a while. Great, and that's pretty much all I have prepared. <laughs> no, uh, so oh, sorry. So I'm just going to leave that up for a while while I talk. First, I'll talk about. So I'm from Lucky Peach Magazine, and uh, we're. Uh, based in San Francisco, and I'm just going to talk quickly about how I came to work at this magazine. Uh, as a teenager, I was really obsessed with... I thought I was going to be a writer, uh, and I would submit short stories to the New Yorker that were just terrible. Uh, and I, would, I was obsessed with collecting literary journals like McSweeney's and Granta and all of this stuff. And I was also really interested in comics at the time. As a kid, I would read you know, Marvel comics and DC comics and... I discovered Chris Ware and Daniel Klaus, and as a teenager, it seemed to me that the intersection of my love of literary journals and uh, art and comics seemed to be this publishing house called McSweeney's in San Francisco, which Jeremy mentioned. Uh, so I applied to intern there when I was 16 years old. I got denied, of course. I applied again when I was 18 uh, and was rejected again. So I applied at the tutoring center across the street from McSweeney's, which was run by the same people, got accepted somehow. Uh, and I was just there to be a general intern. I had no interest in, or had no knowledge about graphic design at the time. Uh, and the store, or the tutoring center was funded by a uh, pirate supply store in the front. They would sell various products and like eye patches they would sell to the people and little hooks uh, just, to su just to support the free tutoring that was going on in the back. Uh, and eventually one day, Justin Carter, who was the manager at the store, asked if anyone could help with the graphic design. And I said, oh, yeah, I can do that, despite not knowing anything about it. And so I worked with him and the other designers there. And eventually I released my first product at this pirate supply store, which is called Treasure Burial Sand. And that's just for if you ever... I was 18 when I designed this, so that's the only reason why I'm leaving it up. Uh, if you've got treasure and you want to hide it really quickly, you just keep this bottle of sand and then kind of just pour it and cover it up and then you, you move on. And I'm just going to see what the next thing is. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to... So this is still me talking about me. Uh, oh, yeah, also I should say that I'm not sure... I'm sure the presentations have been very serious and good, but I hope you just think of this as some nice comic relief and silliness, because I don't really have that much to say. Uh, so, <laughs> so eventually, just through, I started designing everything that I could get my hands on after I found that I took a liking to the software and everything. Uh, and so I designed flyers for friends' bands and, uh, you know, press releases and all these sort of little things. Uh, and eventually I became friends with the people at McSweeney's and they let me design some charts there for their uh, monthly magazine called The Believer. And so this started when I was 18, and here are just some of them. Um, whoop, oh, it's too much. <laughs> and then... <laughs> and uh, so then uh, I met a girl. She moved to the East Coast. Uh, I decided I wouldn't go to college. I moved to New York. Uh, and interned with a graphic designer named Paul Sayer, who's a very talented guy. And um, uh, there he, we would work on editorial illustrations and book covers and things like this. And uh, one day, at the end of my internship, he sat me down and he told me, he was like, Walter, you're not very good with type. <laughs> you're not very good with color. 
Uh, and so he told me that you need to work twice as hard as the other designers just to, uh, just to match their talent. So I really took that to heart. And it was all true at the time. I was only 19, and I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, and so I kind of carried that with me all throughout. And at the same time, while I was interning with him, the seeds of Lucky Peach were starting to be planted uh, at McSweeney's Publishing back in San Francisco, where uh, Chris Yang, David Chang, and Peter Meehan uh, worked on a food section for a... Uh, we're doing... Or McSweeney's has a quarterly magazine called the McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, and for one special issue, they decided that they would do a magazine prototype called the McSweeney's Panorama. Uh, and I applied to be a designer there and also got rejected again. Uh, but so they started doing this food section. Uh, they did this food section and the relationship went so well and the end product came out so well that when it came time to develop uh, the print counterpart to an app that Momofuku and David Chang were developing, they came to Chris uh, they asked me to, or th sorry, then at the time McSweeney's was finally trying to hire me after I was producing work over with Paul Sayre. Uh, and they said they were looking for a junior designer. Me and this girl had broken up. So, boom, I flew back to San Francisco. Uh, and, uh, at the interview, Chris Ying, who was the editor-in-chief of our magazine, he sat me down and said, in a few months, we might be starting some sort of food magazine. Uh, David Chang, who's a chef, and Momo Fuku, there's a restaurant group in New York, they're involved. And at the time I was like, yeah, 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 sounds good. Even though I didn't really know what any of that meant. And I just kind of <laughs> put my head down and didn't really think about it for a while. But uh, then a few months later, we're in the middle of production on our very first issue. I turned 21 uh, during the production. Chris Ying bought me my first legal beer in America which started, you know, this lifelong addiction to alcohol that, <laughs> that I'm currently on. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, and so here is the cover of our first issue. It was a ramen issue. Uh, and yeah, so at the time, we worked with our, we were working with another designer at McSweeney named Brian McMullen, and he picked out this photograph. Uh, and then he just said, we had maybe, you know, 10 hours or something until this magazine was due to press. And uh, we needed a cover. We needed a logo type. Brian sat down and scrawled out Lucky Peach uh, with a Sharpie. And he asked me to do the rest of the lettering. Uh, and so I just did it. And we never really thought about it. Then we released the first issue. And we went, we, we had a print run of 40,000, which, which, which was, um, you know, expecting a lot from the McSweeney standards. Usually the print runs are much, much lower there. And, uh, but... We released it, and the expectations were pretty low, but we were blown away, blown away by uh, the need for it. And so we ended up increasing the print run once, and then again, and now we have kind of leveled out at about 100,000 copies for each issue, which we're really excited about. And uh, here are just some early spreads from this issue. But I should say that it took a lot t to get these designs because... I'm, I wasn't very I wasn't very talented at the time. I had a had an idea of what I wanted, but I didn't really have a sense of how to make it happen. So, uh, and then I'm just going to run through the next couple of covers. After we did the first one, uh, always in the back of my head, I was kind of not so interested in doing the handwritten style. But after one issue and it became popular, uh, we kind of got a little hemmed in. So here's a cover of our second issue, uh, the Sweet Spot issue. Uh, then here's the third one. This is a pig butt getting tattooed uh, in America, or I guess it's a big trend for chefs to get pork tattooed on themselves. So we got a pork butt and then tattooed a man on it. Uh, but, so yeah, I wasn't so satisfied with the direction of these covers at the time. And I wanted to change it. Uh, and so when it came time to do our fifth issue, I changed things up a little bit. This is an exploding takeout box taken uh, 
it was an exploding take off box, and I wanted to keep it sort of uh, still as energetic as the other covers, but eventually pave the way for some quieter covers, uh, which more reflected the tone of the magazine, I think, at the time, or m magazine now. And uh, here's our travel issue. This is uh, by a guy named Christopher Boffoli, uh, and he works exclusively in these miniature food items. Uh, here's our gender issue. <laughs> so half of it is, it's, it's a reversible magazine. Half is for men and half is for women. Uh, <laughs> uh, here's our all-you-can-eat issue, which I'll talk about more later. And this is an illustration by Jordan Spear. Uh, who's a very talented artist from Kentucky. Here's our seashore issue, where we switch things up a little bit. Uh, this is by Robert Beatty, who's also from Kentucky, and is friends with Jordan Spear. Uh, here's a cover of our most recent issue, which is our obsession issue. And this is just uh, from a bakery that's just a couple of blocks from my house in San Francisco that I really like. And so when, and we're also, we, they're also featured in the magazine. But when it came time to figure out what we were obsessed with, uh, we all kind of agreed on this. Uh, I'm going to talk about the recipes in our magazine really quickly. Uh, so it all started out, here's, uh, here's what the McSweeney's Panorama food section looked like. Uh, and they carry that over to the first issue. And the recipes were exclusively designed by Chris Yang for a while, who's the editor of the magazine. Uh, and this kind of flowchart style ended up being a little bit too hard for us to manage. We're kind of a small staff, uh, and we don't plan things very well. So we didn't have a lot of time to design a flowchart for every single recipe. So we um, ended up making it a little simpler at first and making the photos smaller. Uh, and then I took over the recipes, and I tried to start introducing larger photos. Uh, and just really quick, this next photo I think is going to be me. Yeah, that's me. Uh, so I put myself in the magazine. Uh, <laughs> uh, and this is from something that's actually kind of interesting. We recreated scenes from the film uh, The Goonies, uh, shot for shot. So we actually went to Astoria, Oregon, where this movie was filmed, and this uh, bowling alley where the scene was shot, and we poured milkshake a uh, milkshake all over me. And then, um, so now I'm kind of getting more into the groove of, now that I've slowly introduced photography back into the magazine, um, or into the recipes. Here are some that I've been doing lately. And this was a crazy dish. This is a food mountain uh, from our holiday issue. Some salad, and then some illustrated, <laughs> people really like salad jokes. Uh, and so, <laughs> some illustrated work. And I guess I left this note for myself just to talk about the process. Uh, so each issue is, um, yeah, I'm just going to kind of wander around the stage. Each issue is themed. Uh, and because it's a quarterly we all, we, I sort of have the time to take a couple of weeks before we start the bulk of uh, reading and assigning and designing the issue uh, to just kind of research that topic. Uh, and so I'll spend a couple of weeks looking up, wait, sorry. Uh, so I'll spend a couple of weeks researching like, oh, what do all you can eat buffets look like? What kind of, what kind of lettering do they use? What kind of artists speak to me about that? particular topic, and I'll compile a list of who I want to work with and what I, think that me what I think that topic means to me and what we can do with it. And so now I'm just going to kind of talk about uh, my favorite example thus far of the kind of work that we do at Lucky Peach, which is uh, our all-you-can-eat issue, uh, which I've had a lot of experience with. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so here's the cover again. Uh, here... So for this issue, I thought to myself that uh, we needed to hire illustrators who really went over the top and did an extremely intricate, extremely intricate work, and a lot of it, and they would fill up the page with all their intense and amazing work. And this is by Roman Muradov, who's an illustrator who also lives just a few blocks from me, 
in San Francisco. Uh, here's an illustration by James. Oh, and I should say also that during the process of researching for this issue, I found there's this typeface that's called Frankfurt, or Frankfurter, I think. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you can see it in like the Dunkin' Donuts logo and uh, all sorts of all-you-can-eat buffets. And, a spe and one example I found was by a group called the Fat Boys who use it on their record, All You Can Eat. And so I designed my own special version of it uh, that we use throughout the magazine. Uh, and so here is an illustration by Andy Reminter. And this was just something that I commissioned uh, just because we like to include a couple of spreads of art for each issue that is unrelated to the magazine. But it ended up dovetailing sort of nicely with the spread that was on that spread that followed it, uh, which is this illustration by Monica Ramos. So this shows a man who's totally bored by all the food that surrounds him and how much food that he has. And then this spread shows uh, all of these people who don't even have access to the food uh, that's also on a table that they can't get to. Uh, and it's an interview with Raj Patel about uh, hunger and the third world countries and what we can do to uh, you know, going forward to make sure that people get the food that they need. Uh, here's an illustration by Carrie Vanderyat. I should say also that uh, a lot of the, a lot of, because it's such a small staff at the magazine, it's just me essentially doing the graphic design, and it's 176 pages. Uh, I like to usually find an artist or find artists who can sort of take over the page and bring their own voice and bring their own style to it uh, and sort of own it. So I just sent Carrie this typeface that, that I made uh, and she recreated it with this butter lettering. Uh, here's a, we do a profile every issue of a chef or an interesting person. Uh, and here's some lettering by Jeannie Fan. Also in this issue, we had a series of all-you-can-eat challenges for the readers to take on as they were reading it. So you can, you know, try to eat a tablespoon of cinnamon all at once, which we also tried, and I failed at it, and it was very violently gross. Uh, <laughs> then you can also eat six saltines in under a minute without drinking anything, and these are by another San Francisco illustrator named Ian Hubert. Oh, and um, I forget the name of this man. When we were discussing the issue, uh, we found out about this French guy who had eaten a plane, an entire plane. <laughs> I guess some of you will know about it. Uh, he'd eaten a plane over the course of his lifetime, and originally it was planned to just be an article where we'd talk about this guy uh, who has a, a pretty interesting life, but we decided eventually to just... Uh, use illustrations throughout uh, to depict his kind of journey. So we, he's, he appears throughout the magazine eating the plane in various stages. Uh, and these were by Domitil Coyardi, who's a French illustrator who also happened to grow up seeing this guy on TV. Uh, and so here are some more of them. And uh, at the end of the magazine he appears and he's eaten the entire thing. <laughs> uh, let's see what else we have. Oh, we also created a neon sign for this issue. Uh, because, you know, what all you can eat to me really means like, oh, these beautiful neon signs that display it. And so we worked with a, uh, a guy uh, from a few blocks from our office uh, named Cameron. And his company is called Arc Signs. Uh, and he made this for us just in a few days. Uh, it was really incredible to work with. Uh, how, many, how long have I been talking for now? Like 20, 30 minutes? So I'm just going to talk about some other things that we've been doing at the magazine. Whoop. So we often like to include uh, extra packaging or little bonuses. In our second issue, we included a package of fruit stickers for people to peel off and apply uh, to any fruits that they might want to put silly stickers on. And on our ninth issue, we had organized a conference in Copenhagen called the Mad Festival, uh, and the theme of it was guts. 
Um, and so we asked our printer, what, 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 what type of options do you have for us? We want to include a mini magazine, but we want to include it in an interesting way. Uh, and they said, oh, well, we can do, we can just have, you can just have a little folder and then a tearaway sheet inside. Uh, and this was notable because myself, Chris Yang, the editor, and Peter Meehan, the other editor, all sent the same exact email at the same time. We said, it can be a person in their stomach, and then you open it up, and then the magazine comes out of it. Uh, so that's what we did. We hired this artist named Celeste Byers, uh, and that is a photograph of, she photographed that herself, uh, and then she illustrated the Guts cover, uh, and some people were pretty freaked out about it when it appeared in their magazine. Uh, oh, and so I'm also going to talk about, we di for our recent holiday issue, uh, we had an idea to create a gingerbread house, uh, and we wanted people to be able to create their own, and we wanted to have an artist rendering. We had all these crazy ideas about it. So we reached out to this artist named Scott Teplin, and um, we just asked him to draw. He was a very talented illustrator. Uh, we, asked, we asked him to draw a crazy gingerbread house, and so he drew this sort of drugged out mansion. It's like a Miami style gingerbread mansion. Um, and so then we took this drawing uh, and we gave it to an architect friend and he made some blueprints for us. And then we also sent it to a chef named Michael Lisconis. And I feel like this is something that we, that this magazine can do well because of our relationship with chefs. Uh, and so we, we went to Michael Lisconis and then he actually built the real-life version of this gingerbread house. Yeah, clap, come on, yeah. You gotta pat, you gotta pat out the time here. I don't have that, I don't have that much to talk about. Uh, and so uh, we weren't content there. Then we got the children of our editors to dress up as, oh, as cops. <laughs> and then they had to kind of destroy this gingerbread house because uh, and I don't, I forgot to include the next slide, but uh, on the next page, I just put one single photograph of the boy cop uh, making his final destruction of the house. And to the right was an ad for a gin company. <laughs> and uh, anyways, we're not allowed to put any pictures of children next to gin anymore. <laughs> And, uh, oh, God, how long have I been talking for? Oh, I have another 15 minutes? Good Lord. Uh, well, what should I talk about? <laughs> What's good? I'm sure I skipped stuff. Uh, just going to take one more sip of this water here. No, 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 don't worry. I'm going to open up my phone and see what notes I wrote down. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, so I guess I should talk about the magazine a little bit. So, wait, so... Yeah, so I don't know if anybody knows about this magazine. So, um, it's a food magazine, but it's not... It's not an aspirational food magazine, and it's not, like, a lifestyle magazine. We don't... We don't have any pictures of, like, sleek, you know, modernist kitchens or anything like that. Uh, we're kind of trying to appeal to people who, uh, who care about where their food comes from or they care to learn about where their food comes from. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> whoop, whoop, whoop. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm going to take out my phone again. <laughs> Nobody talks to me about this presentation after I'm done. Uh, and yeah, we want to teach them about what goes into making their food and what makes it so important. Uh, but mainly, uh, we're trying to appeal to people who like good stories and 
people who enjoy good art. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and skip over here. I meant to write a lot more, as you can tell. Uh, and I really meant to write a very inspirational ending that would talk about uh, what we can do as magazine makers and, you know, the future of our industry and all of that. Uh, but I am just one person who works at this magazine, and there's a lot of pages to get done. Uh, so I think I might try to end it here. <laughs> uh,